Touchdown! 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 The Bills make me wanna shout. Kick your heels up and shout. Throw your hands up and shout. Throw your head back and shout. But come on now, the Bills are making it happen now. Stand up now, come on and shout. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say shout it right. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Buffalo Fanatics podcast. I am your host, as always, Fern Bannatine. And for uh, my regular listeners, if you tuned in last week, you know that I went over an all-decade team for the Buffalo Bills on the offensive side of the ball. I looked back at the last 10 years, uh, 2009 to 2018, and I picked a player for every offensive position to round out an all-decade team. And this week, I'm going to follow that up, and I'm going to do the defensive side of the ball. And I'm definitely more optimistic about the defensive side of the ball. I think over the last 10 years, we're going to put together a pretty good product of players. Unlike the offensive side of the ball, where we had some weak, below average starters at quite a few positions. We had Tyrod Taylor at quarterback. I had to stick Jordan Mills out there at right tackle because there wasn't a better option. A tight end with Scott Chandler, uh, not exactly a high-end tight end, so it was a little depressing to do, but I see a much better product here on the defensive side of the ball. But before we get into this all-defense decade team, uh, I want to give my take on the whole uh, Melvin Gordon scenario. Uh, If you haven't heard, Melvin Gordon, the running back for the Los Angeles Chargers, is likely going to demand a trade if he doesn't get a new contract. There's been whispers, at least, that the Buffalo Bills may be a viable trading partner for the Chargers. And this has sparked quite a bit of debate in the Buffalo Fanatics community and across other Buffalo Bills fan sites. And the speculation is that uh, this would entail us either uh, trading McCoy as part of a deal for Melvin Gordon or cutting McCoy and making Melvin Gordon our starting running back. And my take is I'm not the biggest fan of the whole acquiring Melvin Gordon scenario. Uh, For a number of reasons. Now, first of all, I will say that uh, acquiring Melvin Gordon to be our starting running back would make this team slightly better, in a vacuum at least. Uh, We'd get younger at running back. I think it's fair to say that uh, Melvin Gordon at this stage in his career is a slight upgrade over LaShawn McCoy, even if McCoy does have a bounce back season. Um, Obviously, beyond 2019 into 2020 and 2021, it's reasonable to expect that LaShawn McCoy is going to continue to a decline, whereas Gordon still has quite a bit of mileage left in those legs of his. Now, that being said, Gordon does have some wear and tear built up already. Even though he's only 26 years old, he's had quite a few carries over the last four years. He had a heavy workload in college as well. But still, ultimately, if you replace uh, LaShawn McCoy with Melvin Gordon, I think it's a valid assessment to say that we are a slightly better football team. And we'd be better not only in the short term, but probably in the medium term as well. Uh, Now we're better, but without considering any other factors. And some of those factors you're going to have to consider, uh, well, first of all, uh, what cost is this going to take to get done? Now, if we look at the parameters of a potential deal, a lot of people have been speculating, and I think uh, I'm on board with this speculation. It would probably cost us about uh, a third round or a fourth round draft pick, and then we'd probably have to throw in a player of value, uh, possibly a running back, possibly LaShawn McCoy. And then you have to look at the contract implications of signing uh, Melvin Gordon to a long-term deal. Of course, that's what he's after. Now, if you want to look at the parameters of a p- potential contract, obviously uh, Le'Veon Bell's contract is a good starting point. He signed for uh, just over $13 million a year on a four-year contract. Uh, Todd Gurley is another running back who signed a recent contract. He's the highest paid running back in the league at about just over $14 million annually. So clearly as the average tends to increase just a little bit each year, uh, you're looking at about a, about a $14 million per year contract. Realistically, I, I think that's what Melvin Gordon is looking for in that ballpark. And this is where the opportunity cost comes in, whereby you're spending quite a bit of money on money that can could have been reallocated to a different player. So the question that has to be asked here is, Uh, Would acquiring a player of Melvin Gordon's stature, a really solid running back in this league, uh, be beneficial enough in terms of wins and losses to offset the draft slash trade capital you're giving up and the salary that he's going to command and, of course, the opportunity cost of um, paying that money to Melvin Gordon, whereas you could have spent that money elsewhere. Uh, Which leads to the first problem I have with this trade scenario, and it comes down to the positional value of the running back position. 
I just don't think that there's a big enough difference in the impact that a really good running back could give you compared to, say, a guy that you can find in the second or third round of the draft. Now, to me, if I'm going to make this type of investment in the running back position, then he's got to be one of those generational type players that really will change the game for you, like your Saquon Barkley types, a Todd Gurley before the injury, uh, maybe LaShawn McCoy in his prime. Now, looking at Melvin Gordon, now first and foremost, and again, if I said this before, he, he's clearly a very good running back in this league. He's had four pretty solid years. But I just don't think he's one of those elite level running backs that's just such a difference maker in so many facets of the game. Now we're talking about a guy who has only has a 4.0 uh, yards per carry average over his four-year career. Uh, we're talking about a guy who's had quite a few injuries in the, over the last four years. He's only once in those four seasons been able to finish a full 16-game season. Uh, granted, the running back position is particularly violent, but that's something to be noted. Uh, we've already spoken a little bit about uh, the heavy workload he's had already in his short career and in his college career. Uh, we can begin to speculate that that m probably makes him more injury prone or uh, more prone to a, a quicker or a steeper decline over the next few years, even at the tender age of 26. Uh, out of the backfield, he, he's an, ab an above average receiver. Uh, he's put up decent receiving numbers, but I don't think he's that elite type uh, receiver out of the backfield like, say, uh, Saquon Barkley again or a David Johnson type. Obviously, Le Le'Veon Bell, another guy. So I, I really have a hard time putting him in that top tier of running backs. Uh, he's probably in that second kind of tier, second echelon of a really good running backs, but not game-changing or great running backs. And for me, it's money that's, and draft capital, for that matter, that's uh, better spent elsewhere. I don't think he's going to make that enough of a difference to really make the cost of what we have to give up worth it for us. So I'm... Uh, I'm more of a no on the whole Melvin Gordon trade scenario. It wouldn't be a terrible move by any stretch of the imagination, of course, but I just don't think it's the best strategic move right now for the Buffalo Bills. Which actually kind of brings me to uh, another consideration for me is you always want to look around the league and look at what the what the good teams are doing, what the teams that have perennial success are doing. Uh, you look at the New England Patriots, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Baltimore Ravens in the AFC uh, these are teams that are uh, perennial playoff contenders year after year uh, by doing things a certain way and not really swaying too much from this philosophy. And I, I believe the Buffalo Bills front office and coaching staff, they've talked about it, building uh, not just a, a short-term winner, but uh, uh, putting together a model of long-term sustained success, which I'm all for. And when you look at the formula for these teams that have had the sustained success, uh, you see a few patterns develop here. Uh, and well, first of all, they all have franchise quarterbacks. That's obviously the most difficult and challenging aspect of building a successful team, but we think we're on the right path with Josh Allen. Uh, but then, secondary to that, is you see a pattern whereby they these teams build through the draft. Uh, with certain exceptions, they don't normally trade for your, say, Melvin Gordon-type players, where you're giving up uh, draft capital and you're giving up, obviously, a, a por portion of your salary cap to sign this type of player. Rather, what they do is they try to pay their own players and try to retain the players that are uh, valuable to them. And, of course, if market forces dictate that they're not able to sign certain players, uh, well, then they take advantage of the uh, compensatory pick process in the NFL draft. And it becomes almost like a, a positive feedback loop where they still keep rebuilding through the draft. Uh, they keep generating these extra draft picks. And it's not to say that they don't go out or sign or trade the uh, key players, but they, they pick and choose very wisely about which players those are. And it's not often in a scenario where they're giving up uh, draft capital and then turning around and signing a guy to a big contract. Now, certainly there's another model and an argument to be made. Uh, you see a few teams right now, like the Chiefs, and the Bears have used a different formula. Uh, when you have a young quarterback like Allen on a rookie contract, uh, you can afford to build up the rest of your roster, uh, dish out one of those uh, $100 million contracts to an elite player, and try to take advantage of your salary cap situation when you have a, an up-and-coming quarterback on a rookie deal. I just don't think Melvin Gordon is the guy that's going to uh, put us over the edge uh, in this type of situation. Now, if we were talking Jadavion Clowney here, now that's a different argument that uh, piques my interest a little bit. I have my reservations about Clowney as well. I uh, just have my reservations about why the Houston Texans would want to move out, move on from him. I don't think he's an elite pass rusher in, say, the Khalil Mack or the Frank Clark mold. 
but I would be much more amenable to that type of deal, even though it would be much more costly for us. I just think that Jadavian Clowney has a, a chance to be a much more of an impact player to really put us over the edge rather than a Melvin Gordon. It would give us a pretty ferocious defensive line in front seven and secondary for that matter. It would probably put us in the elite defense category. And you put an elite defense together with a young up-and-coming quarterback like Josh Allen, uh, you have a real window of opportunity there for success. I mean, with Clowney, what you could do is give him one of those front-loaded contracts so that the significant portion of his contract is paid out by the time you have to pay your young quarterback. Uh, That's probably a situation that I'm, I'm a little more agreeable to. I just do have a few reservations about whether Clowney is that guy or not that can be that impact pass rusher. But in general, just going out and getting an elite pass rusher for me would be the better strategic move rather than going out and getting uh, your second tier type running back like the Melvin Gordon types. All right, we got into a little bit of a rant there. Uh, My opinion on the whole Melvin Gordon and the Jadavian Clowney uh, potential trade opportunities. Uh, Now let's get into the all-decade defensive team. And we're going to start on the defensive line. Uh, We're going to start a defensive tackle. And what better player to start with, of course, than Kyle Williams at one defensive tackle spot, manning the three technique. He is actually the only player on this all-decade team that played all 10 years, played the whole decade as a starter, and a very productive starter at that. Even up until late in his career in 2017 and 18, he wasn't the player that he used to be. But he was still a pretty effective starter, uh, an above-average starter. And quite frankly, as we all know, he's been the heart and soul of this team over the last 10 years. If I had to name a captain for this all-decade team, uh, Kyle Williams would be that player. He's been a great leader in the locker room. He's been a great mentor for younger players. He's been great in the community. And just his personality exemplifies what Buffalo football is all about. Uh, So Kyle Williams is going to start things off here at defensive tackle. And now um, at the other defensive tackle position, uh, this one's pretty much a shoe in as well, even though he didn't end his career here in Buffalo on the best terms. Uh, We're going to choose Marcel Darius here, who now plays for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And it's funny, for as much of a reputation as he has as maybe a bit of a lazy player, a bit of an underachiever, he was uh, dominant in a few years here with the Buffalo Bills. The peak of his career here in Buffalo came in 2014 when he put up double-digit sacks, really as a one technique. Also, always a great run stopper, of course, at a guy who's about 350 pounds. Uh, Even early in his career, he came in as a top-five pick, of course, in that absolutely loaded 2011 draft class. Uh, His first few years here in 2011 and 2012 were very effective as well. And then his best two years, the two years he was dominant, of course, is uh, 2013 and 2014, which we mentioned. And then he fizzled out a little bit. Actually, it coincided with the time when Rex Ryan came in here and kind of changed the defense up. And his scheme wasn't putting our best defensive players in positions where they can uh, be the best that they can be. Uh, You'll see with the next player as well, he also had problems uh, late in his Buffalo Bills career with Rex Ryan. But given those dominant years, Marcel Darius... Uh, definitely belongs and definitely has a place on this all-decade Buffalo Bills team. So he's our second defensive tackle. So we'll move on to a defensive end. Uh, And there's some pretty good options at defensive end as well. Uh, We'll start with another player who uh, did fizzle out late in his Buffalo Bills career, but another guy who had some dominant years before Rex Ryan came in and uh, changed the whole nature of this defense. And that's Mario Williams. Uh, Many of you Buffalo Bills fans might remember back in 2012 when Williams, the superstar freak defensive end from the Houston Texans, uh, was a free agent. Free agency had opened and there was a lot of speculation and anticipation that Williams may sign with Buffalo. Uh, It was a bit of a roller coaster a few days where he had visited visited the Bills brass. He was visiting with our ex-general manager, Buddy Nix. I believe that (laughs) it took about two days for him being here in Buffalo before the news came down that um, Williams had signed a $100 million deal with the Buffalo Bills. And it was a very exciting time for us as Bills fans because we obviously don't tend to attract some of these big free agent names. And this seemed like a bit of a game changer for us. And his first three years here with the Bills from 2012 to 2014 were, quite frankly, dominant. He had 38 sacks over those first three seasons. That's an average of just under 13 a year. 
You combine that to 2014 when Marcel Darius had 10 sacks. Jerry Hughes had a big year uh, with Marcel's production. Uh, we had one of the most dominant defenses in the league. Uh, and then unfortunately, <laughs> what happens after that is Rex Ryan gets hired, tries to change this defense. Most of these players just aren't as effective in this new look defense, including Mario Williams, who had his struggles under Rex Ryan. He was notoriously being dropped into coverage, which he took issue with and he was outspoken with and those last two years weren't the best years here for Mario Williams and many of us remember him for uh, those last two years as is the same with the case with Marcel Darius uh, but let's not forget that uh, before Rex Ryan came in these two players were having some dominant years here with the Buffalo Bills um, and it's fortunate how it all went down but they definitely uh, Darius and Williams both belong on this all-decade team. Now the next defensive end position um, it really came down to uh, a choice between two players, uh, Aaron Schobel and Jerry Hughes. Um, however, Aaron Schobel actually only had one year um, here with the Buffalo Bills over the last 10 years before his early retirement. And that was in 2009 when he was very effective. He had a nice 10 sack season. Uh, but I'm going to have to give the nod to Jerry Hughes here just for longevity purposes. He's clearly been our best pass rusher over the last four years. Really, he's been our only consistent pass rush that over the last four years. Now, we've talked ad nauseum on the show about how his sack production isn't always what you would expect for a premier pass rusher or a number one pass rusher, uh, but he gets a lot of pressure, even though he doesn't always finish. We've talked about this. Um, and before these last four years, he was getting quite a bit of sacks. He had two straight double-digit sack seasons, uh, 10 sacks a year, uh, when he was surrounded with Marcel Darius, Mario Williams, and Kyle Williams. It was quite a defensive front. Uh, we had that Jim Schwartz attacking scheme. Before that, we had Mike Petten, who was a pretty aggressive defensive coordinator as well. Uh, so Hughes has clearly demonstrated that he is capable of putting up those big numbers. And uh, going into 2019, we hope that uh, Ed Oliver coming in here, Trent Murphy starting to regain his old form pre-injury. We hope that additional pass rush will help Jerry Hughes once again start to finish those, some of those plays. All right, at the second level, at the linebacker position. Now, here's a case where we had a, we had a guy here who played for us for quite a few years, um, had that long, longevity kind of consideration going for him, and that's Preston Brown, who played for us from 2014 to 2017, uh, was our starter and a bit of our defensive quarter, quarterback out there. Uh, but what I saw was an average to below average starter, who a guy who was always kind of replaceable. So I re really wanted to take a stand here, and I wanted to find a player who maybe didn't play with us as long, or players who maybe didn't play with us as long, uh, but played better or played at a higher level when they were here. So I was able to find a way to leave Preston Brown off this all-decade defensive team. Uh, and this is no offense to Preston Brown, but it's just I really wanted to put out a defensive team here who uh, we steered clear of average players because I think I was kind of forced to cut out some average players on the all-decade decade team because there just wasn't really any realistic substitutions. Uh, but here on defense, uh, we do have a few. Uh, we'll start on the weak side, and it's a player who's uh, currently on the Buffalo Bills roster. Uh, it's Matt Milano. Uh, here's a player that came in two years ago as a rookie and it exceeded all expectations, uh, won the starting job and put together a very impressive rookie season. Uh, this last season in 2018, he's only actually improved. And <laughs> I think we're all optimistic that him and Tremaine Edmonds will grow together into uh, two dominant linebackers over the next decade or so. Uh, now in the middle of the defense, uh, we're going to choose a player who... Played outside linebacker during his time here with the Buffalo Bills, but I'm going to move him inside on this all-decade team, and that's Nick Barnett. Uh, Barnett came in as a big free agent signing in the 2011 offseason, uh, came over from the Packers, and he played two years here where he was very effective and very active. He averaged 120 tackles over those two years before being released in 2013 when we uh, had a little shakeup and wanted to reduce our cap number. Doug Marone had just come in as a new head coach. Uh, Mike Pettin was coming in to run a new defense. So it was just a lot of kind of circumstances around him being released. But he was very effective in those first, in his only two years actually, with the Buffalo Bills. And now it's a strong side linebacker. Uh, this one wasn't too difficult. Uh, we're going to go with uh, one of the heart and soul players of our current team. And that's Lorenzo Alexander, our current strong side starting linebacker. 
Alexander's been part of this roster since 2016 when he came in and really was only expected to be more of a utility player, but he quickly formed into a, an actually dominant pass rusher. During the first half of that season, he was up there. He may have been the leader, if I recall correctly, in sacks for quite a bit of that first half of the year, and he ended up finishing with 12 and a half sacks, uh, which was uh, by far a career high for him. Uh, he really excelled in that Rex Ryan scheme that had defensive linemen free up open lanes for, for Alexander to get to the quarterback. And in the past two seasons, even though he hasn't put up the same sack numbers, he's been one of our most effective uh, defensive players out there. I really think that he took on more of a leadership role in uh, Kyle Williams' absence after his retirement this last year. And when we, were, when we were struggling early on on the defensive side of the ball and more prevalently on the offensive side of the ball, Alexander was one of the players, the leaders of the team that really stepped in and uh, got this ship turned around. And by the end of the season, we had one of the better de- defenses in the league. Now, there were a few other linebackers that I considered for this all-decade team. Of course, we had Kiko Alonso, who came in here and had just a brilliant rookie season. Unfortunately, he suffered a devastating injury and was never really able to bounce back before he was traded for LaShawn McCoy, of course, to the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Another guy that I considered was uh, Nigel Bradham, who played on the strong side for a few years before signing with the Eagles. Uh, He he was a solid contributor, a solid starter, unspectacular, but a solid enough player. Uh, But I think I really got the three best linebackers, all things considered, on the field here in the solid decade team. Now turning it over to the secondary, and we're going to start at cornerback uh, with another player who didn't have the most popular of endings to his Bills career. Uh, most importantly because he signed with the New England Patriots after he left us, and that's Stephon Gilmore. Uh, But let's not lose sight of the fact that he came in here as a rookie in uh, 2012. He came in calm, cool, and collected, and was professional from day one, uh, and quickly developed into a shutdown cornerback. Uh, He played five solid seasons here from 2012 to 2016. Now, I wasn't the biggest fan of his play in 2016 when uh, he knew that he was in a contract year, I thought he played a little soft, made a lot of business decisions where he wasn't really tackling as physically and violently as he probably could have. That's his prerogative, but uh, he was dominant enough in those few years when he was here that he's definitely a part of this all-decade team as a shutdown cornerback. Now, the other cornerback position, uh, this one's not very hard to choose either. I'm going to pick Tredavious White, another player who came in as a rookie, a first-round draft pick, and held down his own immediately. Had a really good rookie year for us back in 2017. And then last year, he only picked up his play. Like uh, Matt Milano, he's another uh, young player who's really starting to progress and has a really good candidate to be a, a, even more of a breakout player going forward over the next year or two. Not that he's not already one of the top cornerbacks in the league. Had a few inconsistencies down the stretch in this last year. I recall one game against the Detroit Lions when Kenny Galladay had beat him a few times. Uh, But every cornerback has those games. And he's a young foundational player on this current Buffalo Bills team. And he's uh, part of this all-decade team as well. Now we move on to safety. And we're going to start with one of the better players that we've had on this all-decade team. Uh, That's Jarius Bird, who played for us all the way back in 2009. Played five seasons with us all the way up until 2013. Uh, Some of you may recall that he came in that rookie year uh, and tied for the league in interceptions with nine interceptions, an astronomical number really that season. Uh, Over the course of those five seasons, he was a three-time pro bowler and just one of our more unique playmakers that we've had in this last decade, and he's going to lock down that uh, first safety position. Now the other safety position is going to go with the current Buffalo Bills player, Uh, There's two really good ones to choose from, but but I'm going to choose Mika Hyde. Definitely Jordan Poyer deserves an honorable mention as well. Uh, Both these players came in, uh, signed in the 2017 offseason, and both have been very effective players in their two years here. Uh, But Hyde's just been a little bit more effective, and he's been been one of uh, the leaders of this defense. He came in his first season, made the Pro Bowl. He was a second-team All-Pro. And then this last season, uh, you can say, comparable to Trey White, that he had an even better season than the previous season. He was a six-ranked safety in the NFL, according to Pro Football Focus last year. He didn't have as many interceptions. The numbers dropped from five to two. Uh, But I think he was one of our best defensive players last year, and he really stabilized that secondary in the second half of the season. Uh, So he's going to get the nod here. 
as our second starting safety here beside Jarius Bird. Now to round this team out, uh, we have one more special teams position to fill, and that's the punter position. And this really comes down to two players. There's two pretty strong candidates here. Uh, firstly, there's Brian Mormon, who was our punter uh, during the early years of this decade. And then following Mormon's retirement, uh, Colton Schmidt was our punter for quite a few years. Both players were pretty, pretty good punters. Uh, they both averaged uh, above average in the net yards per average. They were both pretty good at positional punting as well. But I'm going to give the nods to... Brian Mormon here as our punter. I don't really have the strong rationale other than to say intuitively that I always considered Brian Mormon one of the top punters in the league and he was a punter I really trusted. Smith was pretty solid as well in his own right. Uh, but a lot, of, but a lot of the time when it comes down to special teams, you just want players that you trust that aren't going to screw things up too badly. And Mormon is a, just a name that I feel a little more comfortable with almost subconsciously. So I'm going to go with Brian Mormon here for that reason. So that rounds out the 2009 to 2018 All Buffalo Bills defensive team. I hope you guys like it. I'd like to hear your opinion. Uh, I'm going to just give you a quick recap. We start on the defensive line. We have Kyle Williams and Marcel Darius, uh, Mario Williams and Jerry Hughes. They form a pretty dominant uh, defensive front. On the second level at linebacker, we have weak side linebacker Matt Milano. In the middle, we have Nick Barnett. And then on the strong side, we have veteran Lorenzo Alexander, who's one of our uh, leaders of our current Bills team. And then we get to the secondary, where we have two pretty solid shutdown corners in Trey White and Stephon Gilmore. And two pretty good safeties as well in Jarius Bird and Mika Hyde. You see a lot of uh, turnovers in that secondary, especially if you get that dominant pass rush going. I'm really happy with this defensive team. I think our offense was... Uh, for no better way to put it, it was pretty shitty for a, a 10-year, all-decade team where on the defensive side of the ball, I'm much more confident about how this team would fare against other NFL teams, all-decade teams. So let me know what you think. You can hit me up on YouTube in the comments section. You can hit me up on Twitter. It's at FBanaty. That's at F-B-A-N-N-A-T-Y or at BuffFanaticsPod. So we'll be back next week, and I think news is going to start to pick up over the next few weeks. Of course, training camp's right around the corner. Uh, we already have some news that I didn't really want to get into today, that whole 18-game schedule fiasco. Uh, maybe one day I'll share my opinions of what, what I think about that if that story continues to develop. Uh, but for this week, I'm out, and go Buffalo Bills!